Hey, can you see me? <laughs> Creative insurgents. Creative insurgents. Ah. <laughs> Gents. <laughs> Hey everybody, this is Corey Huff with The Abundant Artist. And Melissa Dinwiddie with Living a Creative Life. And this is the Creative Insurgents Podcast. Where we are all about living a creative life according to your own rules. Woo! Yeah! Yeah! So Melissa, <laughs> living in France is not paradise. <laughs> really? Gosh. You know, even though it is pretty cool, it's not necessarily easy all the time but that's okay <laughs> I look at it as a metaphor for everybody else even though you <laughs> even though you may be having the time in your life and doing the thing that you most want to be doing in your life and as we've been saying to each other as we've uh, gone through uh, some challenges in the last few days embrace the chaos <laughs> well speaking of chaos you know, there's embracing it, and then there's there are ways to to minimize the chaos, right? And I'm about to start that with my great clutter bust, which I'm running for the second time. And uh, the doors are open actually through the month, so if you miss the first day of October 1st, you can still sign up and get your studio cleared out, your garage of doom, your closet of doom. <laughs> And enter the holiday season with serenity. Where can people sign up for the Great Clutter Bust? You can find it at melissadinwitty.com slash great dash clutter bust. So in the same adversity talk so that I've been having uh, finding a good internet connection here in France, which is a little weird, but true. And that is why I was not present when we interviewed today's guest. That's right. I did the interview myself with Shirley Williams. I think you're going to love this interview, though, Corey. It's so she Shirley just gives you this the straight shot here. What it takes to really build a business around your art. Well, let's go ahead and just uh, cut right to it. Let's do it. Well, today's guest is Shirley Williams, who is an abstract expressionist painter. And I am so excited to have Shirley on the show. I invited Shirley to be a guest on Creative Insurgents because she left a comment over on the Creative Insurgents website on the episode that we did with Jolie Gillibo in which she wrote, I've been making a living as a painter for 20 years. It's rare to hear an artist be so candid and generous. And I thought, oh my goodness, she's been making a living as an artist for 20 years. I have to talk to this woman. So I've since had a couple of long, very candid conversations with Shirley, and what her blog comment didn't say is that not only has she been a full-time artist for 20 years, but she has pursued just about every way possible of making a living from her art. She has reinvented herself at least five times in the process, and she is a wealth of expertise and experience. So Shirley, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story and expertise with us today. My pleasure, Melissa. Thank you. I'm glad to be here and maybe talk to some of the other artists out there. Um, so one thing that you mentioned that, that I found really interesting is, you know, a, a lot of artists are struggling with um, underpricing their work. That tends to be a big issue for, for so many people, particularly women, but are also artists in general. Yep. And to hear you say that your prices had gotten too essentially high. too high. Yeah. Can you I talk a little bit about that Catch-22? Yeah. Well, when I first started working on my own, and I think I, I would give this advice to most artists, start low. Um, you know, cover your costs, but you know, look at what other people in your your sort of um, uh, category are selling your work for. Uh, be sure you cover your framing costs, etc. I was selling my work in the beginning for about um, like a framed work on paper for about three hundred dollars, and was making my my costs, and I was making enough to get by. Um, once I got into the and, and, and I was selling a lot. It was getting to a point where I was raising my prices quite a bit, and I think that's how you raise your prices. When you when you end up having less work than what you're selling, then you raise it. But I would never raise it more than 10, 15 percent at a time, and then see how would happen. And if it would sell, it would keep getting you know a little higher and a little higher. And and by the time I reached the galleries, they were uh, reached that market. 
they were selling the same piece would would have sold for maybe seven hundred dollars or oh, nine. Wow. So they had gone up quite a bit in that ten years. Once I got into the galleries, they of course doubled everything because they have to make their fifty percent. You know that's what they charge, so the costs are very high. Um, so then that same one thousand dollar piece was now two thousand dollars. Then, uh, as my reputation increased, and I was having, I was getting more involved with lecturing and and uh, you know touring my work and that sort of thing and museum shows because I've also done that, um, and picking up American galleries, they found my work too low. Oh, to price too low. So the same two thousand dollar piece suddenly went up to five thousand dollars. Wow. And once I did the museum shows, they were in the six thousand dollar range. So once I got kind of had to go pull back um, from the galleries because I wasn't making any money. I'd have a show. Um, I'd have to ship my work all over the states or something. Shipping costs were very high. Um, insurance, uh, all of the the. You know all of the in, the other prices, the the costs that go along with having a show, marketing, etc. Plus the fifty percent commission and traveling down to the show for the openings, etc. It was ridiculous because I would might sell one piece at those high prices and make no money. Wow! So it was getting harder, and there would be people like in droves turning up to these shows, and it was ooh ah, but it wasn't paying my bills, you know. And that's when I had to again. Think about what is it that I really want to do. I'm painting, but nothing. I'm getting lots of compliments, and I'm making a great reputation. But I don't know if I want to be famous. I want to make my living from this, you know. So um, I had to re again rethink about how I was going to market myself. And so thinking that I'm going to pull away from galleries. First of all, all those costs disappear. So I'm able to. I was able to bring my price down again. Although I have to, I had to be very careful because I do have collectors that have spent all those big bucks. Right. So what did you do? Well, I, I, for a year or two, I just kind of sat on my hands and thought, maybe the economy will change, or maybe the galleries will pick up, and I, I just. You know, I was selling smaller work at lesser prices because it's not really, it's the huge pieces that really sell for, for big bucks. And those are the collectors that would notice. So um, I kept the bigger pieces aside and just concentrated on marketing smaller, piece, marketing smaller pieces. And um, so I ended up with a lot of larger pieces. And, and uh, then I had a show locally um, in my studio. I had an open studio and said, you know, I just got to make some room. And so I dropped my prices by half. And out of that, I sold most of them because then the collectors didn't feel so bad. They thought, okay, you're making room. Here's a great chance to, you know, I basically marketed it as um, these are pieces that haven't sold in shows that can no longer be shown as new work, right? Ah, so I would yeah. drop it down that way. So once I did that, um, the local market then became um, enthusiastic again because I I had kind of exhausted the higher price clientele. There's only so many people that are going to buy a piece at that price. Right. Usually they want to buy it through a dealer or uh, you know that sort of thing. So that's how I basically managed it. I basically gradually tried this, tried that until I found my my sweet spot. And now I can sell again, you know, at a at a, a price that is not internet ready. It's not, you know, there's. I'm still playing with that whole marketing structure at this. Mm. The pricing structure, I mean. But the way that I do price my work is on a per lineal inch basis for so it's height plus width. High plus height plus width, which is how galleries or professional galleries tend to do it. Oh, they that, do it linear rather than square inches. Yeah, square inches don't work out with different media. So they'll have a different lineal um, rate based on the, the medium. So if it's on paper and then plus the framing, or if it's on canvas, you know. So um, I've kind of settled down at a rate of 35 for, for canvas, $35 per lineal inch. And mm -hmm. that's to be, for me, the sweet spot at this point. I don't know. You know, and I'm not, I don't know that I would drop it more because of my costs. But I would bring it up, and I may. And is that, well, you know, I will 
probably drop it for a, an open studio, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And is that, it's the same multiplier, that $35, no matter whether it's a 4x4 four four or 48x48 48 48 or whatever size it is, right? Yeah. If you do it per square inch, uh, your smaller pieces become too expensive. I think that's, anyway, well, that's not how the galleries do it. And people think that's how they do it, but they do it per lineal. Yeah, the the difference between the smaller pieces and the larger pieces becomes enormous when you do it by enormous the square inch. Yeah, it's, it's sort it's of not fair, you know. Yeah, it makes more sense by the because that's how I do it as well as the linear yeah. inch. Yeah. Well, one of the things that that you said uh, that I so resonate with when we talked before is that the big and you just you mentioned this as well just now is that the biggest thing to be really clear about is what you really want for yourself. That's actually the very first lesson in um, the Art Empowers Me course that Corey and I run and in our Creative Insurgents Handbook. One of, our, one of the lessons is figuring out what you really want, not what television tells you you should have or your mom tells you you should have, but what do you really want for yourself? So, And for example, you have said that you can't do both museum shows and commercial sales. So well, it's uh, no, I don't think that that would work. I mean, it's a completely different market, and that's when I said I reinvented myself. Um, there's one thing that's very constant if you want to be a professional artist, and that's change. That's the only <laughs> thing. <laughs> you know, you, you have to decide. Um, when I decided, the day that I decided I wanted to sell my small, you know, little boutique deli and not be a self-represented artist and go into the gallery trade, I had to give all that up because I had to give up all the, you know, self-representation. They don't want you self-representing. They want you to be working for them. Then you, you, you get into the museum area, and I realized well, after I had a museum show, that wasn't my cup of tea. Everybody works and they think, oh, one day I'll be in a museum. But getting there is a whole different story. It's a lot of work. It, you really have to give up that whole concept of being able to sell it festivals and fairs and that's not professional. They don't consider that professional. You have to be very, um, you have to intellectualize your art, you know, right. commercialize it. And I realized that wasn't what I was in it for, that I resonated more with the viewer at one-on-one -on -one and knowing my clientele and getting to know my collectors and my fans on a personal level, which is another thing that didn't resonate with me with galleries. Even though they made me a lot of money and it was great for my resume, they won't tell you who bought it. I just get a call, you know, somebody in New York City bought one of your paintings. Oh great, who is it? Because I'd like to send them a thank you card. They won't tell you, right? So, uh, because they don't want you selling directly. Right. So, you have to really decide what you want. And along the way, through these 20 years, I've realized that with my background, uh, business and marketing, um, the museum world didn't really take to that. You know, they didn't think of that as being normal. Uh, <laughs> you know, I should have been speaking art, talking art speak. Yeah. And, you know, and, this, and galleries didn't want me doing that either. You know, they want the control. And what I've realized is that I'm the happiest when I'm in control of my own career. Now that means, you know, nothing's ever perfect. That means that I work twice as hard because 50% of my time is painting and 50% of my time is direct mark. Like when I say direct marketing is interacting with my, my, my client base and my collectors yeah. and potential collectors. So these things you know, over the years are constantly bobbing and weaving and you've got to try things and you've got to be very clear what is it that you want because the minute I decided back, you know, that I want to be in the galleries, I then I focused on that mm -hmm. and I started sending out resumes and contacting galleries and doing my research and doing my homework and everything else fell aside and then become very successful very quickly. If you want to concentrate on internet sales, you got to focus on that. The last three months, I've done nothing but study social networking and internet sales, and you know, like when I do something, I kind of have OCD on it. You know, I kind of do it. All the time. <laughs> so now I'm ready, and it's um, and I know it's going to be successful because I have a business plan, I have a marketing plan, and I'm people think I'm insane because I can paint on one day and I can do that on another 
it just happens to be the way I do things. But I much prefer personally to be in control. Yeah. As it's so true. You, you really, I think a lot of artists go into that. I mean, I know I certainly did when I started out as an artist. I didn't really have a clear understanding of how different the various different kind, you know, ways of being an artist are. You know, there's yep. the museum artist, there's the fine art gallery artist, there's the street festival artist. You know, there's all these different sort of ways of 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 being an artist and working and, and making money from your work, and they're not always compatible with each other. No, no. In fact, um, about four year, three years ago, I was approached by. Uh, I'm now a licensed public. I'm published. Um, I'm published by a licensed international um, publisher out of Austin, Texas. And when they first approached me, I was still. Re I, I was about to open a museum show, and I was really wondering should I do this will this kill my career you know which career do I want it created this angst for about four months and then when I finally agreed to do it um, then I, I, I didn't tell anybody for a long time I didn't tell my clients I didn't tell my galleries because I thought I'm gonna be you know I'm gonna be blacklisted I can't tell anybody Wow. so you know, people think all these things, that any one of these things that have happened to me, many people have said, oh my God, your career is made. You know, you're going to be so <laughs> rich. You're going to be so famous. And that's the other thing that I think a lot of artists don't realize. There is never one opportunity. There's never one phone call that's going to change your life. And all you can do, all you need to do is sit in your studio and paint all day and be creative and somebody else will make the money for you. It doesn't work that way. It does not. That's right. a dream that I still wish I could get, but it doesn't happen. Oh, yeah. A perfect example. I mean, how things can go sideways really fast. Um, 2008, um, the, the recession started in September. I think that's when that 2008 collapse, September. I had a show opening in February in Dallas, Texas of 2009. And this guy was an international art dealer, and his he had already made a plan that we were going to have the show. This was before the recession. I had we had planned the show for about eight months, and um, it was opening in February. And he said, "Okay, here's the plan. We're going to triple your prices. That's through the roof. The same piece was going to sell for fifteen thousand. Wow. So he said we're going to have. He he had all the clients lined up and all chomping at the bit." Uh, so he said, we'll have a show in Dallas, then we're going to do Laguna Beach, uh, then we're going to bring you to London, England, we've got that lined up after that, we'll tour it, um, and then you're going to go into seclusion for a year and paint, and we're going to do it again and double your prices again. So oh he my God. Whole, you know, he had a whole 10 year plan that we were going to, like, you know, I was the thing, right? I was the next big famous person that's going to make him and me and everybody famous. And then the recession happened. So we had the show in spite of it. Uh, the turnout was great. We sold three pieces. And he said, the other two, all the galleries have, every, the plants scuttled. We can't do wow. it. So there's an example about, of how you can think you're going to make it. Everything's going to happen. It doesn't. And, you know, in retrospect, I'm glad it didn't because... I'm not so sure I'd want to be handled like that, you know. Mm, yeah. Well, I remember the the other thing you said about when you did the museum show. I remember you saying that you th thinking like this is this is the big step. This is going to make my career. Oh yeah. That in fact it's the first step in a career to being a museum artist. Exactly. I thought doors were going to open magically from there that, you know, and there was, there was, it was amazing. I, we had an opening that there were 200 people there and, um, you know, the press and it was just, oh my gosh, I thought this is amazing. This was another opportunity that I thought was going to change my life. And it was very exciting, but the letdown after, mm. I went into this depression almost because I thought that was that was not what I expected. It was very um, uh, clinical. You know, it was a very, it, what, it wasn't a creative endeavor. It was more of a, yeah, a clinical 
very sort of distant, off-putting thing for me. For some reason, I mean, other people might like and I love it. It just wasn't for me. Yeah, I'm not I don't tend to approach my art intellectually. You know, I'm much more of an emotional, abstract expressionist painter. Um, it has meaning to me. You start talking about personal meaning with a curator at a museum, and they kind of go <laughs> off. They don't want to talk that way. It makes them uncomfortable. And you know, they start talking. You know in this weird language that they speak, and I understand it, and I can speak it, but it isn't me, you know. So um, they just thought I was, uh, I mean, I just didn't, it wasn't a mesh, it wasn't a fit. Yeah. Well, yeah. so interesting because I know uh, the, the, the buyers that have bought my work that I've interacted with, whether it's via email or in person or whatever, they connect with that emotion, right? They're not really yeah. interested in some academic intellectual explanation of form or something. They they want to connect on a gut level. That's exactly it. And then and and that's exactly the part that was missing. There was no soul in the experience. There was a, almost an aloofness about yeah. art and about art. you should not look at art as something with emotion, you should look at it as something as, like you say, academic exercise, and that just didn't fit with me. It's so interesting to hear you say that because that's really the the perception that I have gotten from those high end galleries and museums is that there's this distance between me and the art and me and the artist, and um, this is, I've never really been able to articulate it that way. But it's really yeah. interesting to hear your your experience. And you know, I think um, unless an artist has been brought up through that environment of the academic art world. Um, it's, it's, it's a goal that I think is an empty goal. Sure, it looks good on a resume, and like I said, I'm very glad, glad it happened to me. Uh, because I think forever, if I hadn't, I would have thought, oh, if I could only. You know, yeah. we all have that feeling, <laughs> if I could only. <laughs> now it's, if I could only figure out the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's it never ends, you know. I mean, right. here I am, 20 years later, and I'm still trying to figure it all out. There's nobody that has the answer for you. I think nobody. that's really the important point is the reality that it never, it never does end. That we're always on this constant learning curve, mm. and that it's not about the silver bullet. It's not about being discovered or whatever. It really doesn't work that way. And I know we've talked about that. Before, can, let's 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 talk a little bit about realism and about you know what artists tend to think often when they go into this notion of I'm going to make a career as an artist, as opposed to what the reality is. Yeah, I, I think that we all. I, I've been very very fortunate. I've had through my my experiences that I, I have collectors that I've got a couple that are even billionaires. You know. Um, and uh, that's not to say to brag, but I know that the first time I had an opportunity like that, I thought, wow, they are so connected. You know, it's going to, again, it's going to lead to something. And, and one thing that I realized through all these people that I've met and these wonderful people who've collected my work is that it's, you build your career one experience at a time, one person at a time, mm -hmm. and one painting at a time. There is no um, every everything is new. You're only as good as your last painting, and that's the other thing. It's your work that's the most important. Like you said, it has to connect with people. If people don't connect to it, you can have every billionaire in the world connecting, collecting you, and and it won't make a difference. Um, so the expectation of finding either that perfect gallery or that perfect collector that person who's going to discover you, that perfect agent. I've also had agents. None of them are perfect. You know, some of them don't pay. Some of them don't, some, some of them you know better than they do how to sell your work. Some of them don't care about the work. They just want anything. You know, some of them care nothing about you. They just care about the work. Everybody is different. And I think that the expectations that an artist has is that they really want to just sit in their studio and paint. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. If that's what you want to do, if that's really your goal, and you don't like marketing, and you don't like business, and you don't like talking to people, that's who you are. Admit that. 
you know don't try to turn yourself into something else but don't waste your life hoping that somebody's going to walk into your studio and discover you you've got to admit to yourself that whatever you put out you're going to get back so if you're not doing the marketing you're not going to get a lot of collectors so everything has a price into as to how you're going to in terms of what you're going to get back yeah so well put it's getting back to what it is that you want what is most important to you and and I think most artists really need to be very honest with themselves as to what their skill sets are um, and the ones that they think they need if they really want to develop then they have to go out and find those skills just like I went out and found the galleries I went out and you know found the um, the collectors that I wanted I, I targeted them and I went after them in ways that were subtle I mean I didn't go banging on their door but I certainly you know kept at them until it so what did, what did you do when you were targeting collectors say uh, the commercial um, commercial collectors or private how, how did you go about it? designers yeah that was really for me that was very lucrative in the beginning um, corporations interior designers are always looking for something now again with them there is a downside they're not that interested in the emotional side of the of the work mm -hmm. they're just looking for something that's going to look good on the sofa over the sofa so how I approach them uh, I learned this when I was in my video days my marketing days is that it takes about nine to fifteen approaches before somebody buys people are shocked when they hear that so um, I always just send out the occasional e you know email uh, one of the things I did was from the very beginning every year I send out 100 handmade uh, New Year's cards mm. they're actually hand painted with my information and I would send them out to, to targeted collected collectors my collectors people who helped me throughout the year it was my way of saying thank you or you know come to the studio sometime no obligation just come and have a look and after a while you send out you know three or four or five years in a row they'll call you because they don't throw them out they're sitting on their desk and I've had you know I've gone to parties where people will come to me and they'll say you know I have every single one of those cards and I love them because every year it reminds me of what happened that year and of course when they're ready for a painting they call me right so that was one way um, I used to have an open house and and approach the uh, the press and do something radio stations uh, do interviews I just call people you know you just phone them and you say hey I've got an idea I've got something happening it's an event um, I did a lot of um, fundraisers. For example, I worked with the the, the symphony orchestra. Um, did a fundraiser for them. Did you know fundraisers for children, children's orchestra, anything to get into the community. I think it starts with the community. You have to build your base. You know, the other thing that I think a lot of artists do is they think, you know, there's no clientele here. If I could only be in New York, or if I could, I had the same dreams. Believe me. <laughs> I showed in New York. It's not that fun. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's. Uh, I think you really have to start where you are. Plant yourself well. Create a following. And people today are all on the internet. They all travel. They all love to talk about the new piece of art they just bought. The word will get out. But you have to be consistent. You have to consistently don't expect the first email to sell out don't keep trying to sell all the time you know if you're selling all the time people don't want to hear from you be thankful be grateful send them some information send them something if you see an article in the paper this would be the other thing I would do if I saw an article in the paper about a collector I would um, I would cut it out mail it to them and say you know congratulations or um, thought you might like a copy of this and they'd call me you know so it's just using your imagination and figuring out how to get to somebody that's brilliant and that that idea of, of sending out the hand painted cards a hundred hand painted cards every New Year's is so brilliant and it really shows your focus on the long game that this mm -hmm. is not a get rich fast <laughs> get rich quick proposition it's not even a get rich slow <laughs> right right like I well mean, yeah talk, talk about the the um, 
I think there's an idea, and certainly when I started my business as a ketuba artist and a calligrapher, uh, my business just grew and grew and grew and grew. Now it was teeny tiny. I mean, it wasn't even you know a living at first for several years, but it just kept growing, and I just I just believed that it would just keep going up. And then when the economy crashed, that was that was like when reality hit that oh, it doesn't just go up. <laughs> no, no uh, in fact, ups and downs are a big big. Aspect. You really need a fallback position. You need savings. You need a husband <laughs> or something or a wife, somebody with money or a parent. Uh, you need a, a, a maybe a part-time job. Um, you need several income streams. I, I don't think that it's possible, especially in this day and age, where there are so many people online. Uh, you know, am, I, I hate to use that word amateurs, but people who are not really professionals who don't take their their creativity overly seriously. They're just out there trying to hey, see if it sells. There's a lot of people like that, and a lot of it is very good work, but it's selling for very small amounts of money. So there are so many people selling art that the competition is really, really stiff. And I think if you really want to be professional, you have to be extremely focused, and you can make a living, uh, but it's never an easy living. My gosh, if I wanted to be in this for the money, I, uh, if I wanted money, I would have still been in the film business. <laughs> Pretty good, but not you know, it, not by comparison to now. It's just right now. It's it's really day to day. You know, you never can take anything for granted. Well, what is your day to day like now? Um, I work as a job. This is my job. I get up, I, I go work out, and then I come to the studio, and um, I try to. I used to try to spend half a day painting and half a day working on the business, and and that that's really too difficult to stretch from right brain to left brain. You know, crazy. So uh, what I tend to do is uh, schedule a full day of painting, and then I just mm. shut down every electronic device, and I paint for two or three days straight. And then I go and do my business for a couple of days and, and do that two or three days. And it's usually a go 10 to 5, 10 to 7, whatever. And a lot of weekends I'm sitting on my computer. That's when I really do my marketing because the more I can do that, the more I can paint. You know? So I really work hard. I, I'm working all the time. It's really my life. You know, it's uh, there's no alternative. I, it's not because I'm trying to make money. It's because it's just my life. I enjoy the people. I enjoy my clients, and I enjoy opportunities like this, meeting you. I know. I think the the, the days when I get discouraged, of which there are many. Oh I, yeah. I Me think too. you know, like oh man, I'm never gonna achieve my the the goal that I have for myself. But then I think, well, I, I'm not. What am I gonna do? I'm not gonna do anything else. <laughs> That's right. Okay. I, I couldn't imagine going back to a job. Meanwhile, I'm working much harder for much yeah. less money. Figure that out. But at least I'm happy. I'm enjoying myself and I'm having fun. And I think when it gets right down to it, um, an artist really needs to think about that. Why are they doing it? If there's anybody out there who wants to be an artist to make money, they really need to get a different idea because it's not a money-making scheme. Um, unless you've got you happen to have something that's a really highly commercial idea and it sells like crazy but then even that that might be good for a year and just like your Ketuba experience you know it can dry up overnight and then what you know how do you reinvent yourself it's like having being a, a one-hit wonder it's not a long-term long-range vision of yourself and then you'll just end up being unhappy for the rest of your life so you really need to to stop I think and think do I do I just love being creative and if so, is that a hobby? Is that good enough? Or do I really want to make a living at it? And if I want to make a living at it or even make a small part-time income, then you need a plan. You need to, to focus. First, what is it you want to accomplish and how am I going to get there? And then if you don't have the tools or the knowledge, go figure it out and do it. You know, plan, work your plan. you got to do it. Um, it's, it's really tough. It's a tough game because being creative is a whole different set of skills than being business. And yeah. you kind of have to master both. And that's the hard part. The other thing that I think a lot of artists try to do is paint for the market. You cannot, right. you cannot paint for a market. 
Um, there's no point in going online and seeing what's selling today. Oh, it's red. Okay, well, all my paint is going to be red. You've got to be yourself. You've got to be yourself. Express yourself. Express your honesty. Do it online the same way. Don't push too hard. Work your pl plan your work and work your plan. And um, then you'll get where you want to go, not where somebody else tells you they should you should go. Wow, what a great and what a great way for to change. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and be prepared for change. Yeah, what a great uh, just summary of everything. I, I would love to keep talking to you for hours, Shirley, but I'm afraid we're out of time. This has just oh. been so fantastic. Thank you so much for joining oh, me today. Pleasure. Maybe we can do it again sometime. I would love it. Great. Okay. You're right, Melissa, that was really interesting. I really liked how Shirley just talked about what it's really like to be an artist. Uh, I think we need more of that. Amen, yeah. So if you liked this episode of Creative Insurgents, we would love it if you would leave us a review on iTunes. You can do that by going to creativeinsurgents.com and clicking on one of the iTunes links there on the right. And if you leave a review, we might just read it out loud on the air, like... Right now, I'm going to read one from C. Mowers. She writes, or he writes, Lisa Call's advice is a must listen. I have known of Lisa's work since 2007 and admire her drive. While I do think she is an introvert, as she says, she has never been private about setting goals and following through with them. I've gotten to know her better personally and think her actions speak louder than words, although her words are equally important. Thank you for this interview. I've already shared the link with many of my artist friends. Woohoo! Thank you, C. Mowers. Thanks a lot, C. Mowers. We really appreciate it. Uh, again, if you go to creativeinsurgents.com uh, to view any of our podcast episodes and then click on the iTunes link, you can leave us a review there on iTunes and we'll mention you on the air. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Creative Insurgents. Creative Insurgents. Subscribe at creativeinsurgents.com.